Hey gardeners, Amy here and I have a special guest with me today. This is Jessica, owner of Earthly Apothecary. She is an herbalist and a wealth of interesting knowledge and today we are going to talk about plantain. My favorite. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> thing is, I'm growing this on purpose because it is such a useful plant as an herb. Um, it has medicinal value and all kinds of other benefits, which is why I asked Jessica to be here today so she could tell you about them because she's qualified to talk about that. I am not. Take it away. <laughs> all right, friends. I think that this might be every herbalist's probably top five favorite plants. Plantain. Not to be confused with plantain, like the giant banana looking species, that's a completely different family. But plantain, or white man's footprint, grows all over the world. There's several, something like 200 varieties that we know of, and one species happens to be native to the U.S., and the species is um, Plantago regelii, and that plant has a little like orange splash at the very base of its leaf, instead of these ones are kind of like white down here, but imagine if that were purple. And plantain is useful for just about everybody. It's what we call a grass herb, generally regarded as safe. This is something that anyone can take. And so the, the most basic and useful purpose of this leaf is if you are outside and you get stung by something, you can find this plant, which grows everywhere. You can chew up a leaf and then you can spit that yummy plantain spit gobulo, go, spit wad on wherever it was that you got stung, put it right on top of it, and it will stop hurting and it will pull out the poison almost immediately. Um, my two-year-old got stung four times because something got trapped under his hair and I instantly found plantain, spit it, chewed it up, spit it on him, he quit crying, and moved on with the day and it was over. That's clever. <laughs> um, it's a great vulnerary, which means it heals wounds topically, but also internally. So we take it inside and folks that are struggling with like ulcers or other tears of the general GI system, those wounds can be aided in healing by this particular plant. So earlier this year, my baby got some eczema all over her chin and neck, and you were talking about making a cream out of plantain. Yeah, we make um, an oil. So you take the plant um, and you macerate it in a carrier oil, I use olive oil, and you let it soak and add some heat and after a while everything that was in the plant is now in your oil and then you can strain your plant matter out and you can use that oil to apply topically. You can make a cream and in the case of Elowen she had this inflamed red dry rash and her skin was obviously irritated so plantain is cooling to inflammatory, inflammatory conditions. And so we put a topical application of plantain oil on it and it did just that. It soothed the inflammation and it soothed the dryness, allowing the body to come back into a state of balance. Another thing to think about um, in terms of a vulnerary wound healing plant is how you would take it internally. Now we talked about an oil to heal wounds on the external surface of your skin, but how about the inside surface of your skin because your GI tract is really the outside on the inside. We get wounds in there, and in the same way, we can use this plant to mend those wounds, but we don't really want to go swallowing a bunch of olive oil to do it. It wouldn't taste very good, and it wouldn't come out very well either. So we can tincture <laughs> this wonderful plant, which means you macerate it in an alcohol instead of oil. Um, and you can look up all about the processes and how to do that, but when you tincture it, you have a concentrated extract, probably in a one or two ounce bottle, that you can take by the teaspoonful, and that helps get the plant constituents on the inside of you to go about mending whatever it is on the inside. This is good stuff. I don't know any of this. <laughs> and it's found everywhere in the world. We call it white man's footprint, or some folks call it that, um, because when the settlers showed up on this continent hundreds of years ago, a few hundred years ago, um, it came with them and it traveled on their wagon wheels and on their, on the, uh, the seeds traveled on their boots as they traveled across the country and everywhere, wherever um, the white folks went, this plant showed up behind them. So I literally the left a trail of this. Yes. Oh, how funny. You could like track people by their, yeah, by, the <laughs> by the plantain trail they left behind. So there are two types of plantain that are really common in our area in eastern Washington. That is broadleaf plantain, plantago major, and buckhorn plantain, plantago lanceolata. There's several common names for each one. Broadleaf plantain is also called broadleaf plantain, white man's footprint, waybred or greater plantain. 
Buckhorn plantain is the common name I know for plantain lanceolata, but it's also known as ribwort, narrowleaf plantain, English plantain, ribleaf, lamb's tongue, and buckhorn. Both of these species are native to Europe. They were brought over by settlers and have naturalized in the entire country. They're not considered invasive just because they're not that big of a deal. And from what I understand, they've naturalized pretty much in all areas of the world where English people have settled. There is a plantain that's native to the United States, but I've never seen it. And I guess it's only found around the Midwest. How to identify this plant? All of them have just plain green leaves, pretty smooth margins, and deep, strong ribs on the back. If you flip the leaves over, you find strong ribs and venation. Parallel venation, which is really interesting. For Plantago major, it's a herbaceous perennial plant with a rosette of leaves, six to 12 inches in diameter. Each leaf is oval shaped, two to eight inches long, and about an inch and a half to three and a half inches broad, but they can get bigger, rarely up to 12 inches long and seven inches broad. It has an acute apex, a smooth margin, and a distinct petiole, almost as long as the leaf itself. There are five to nine conspicuous veins over the length of the leaf. The flowers are small, greenish-brown, with purple stamens, produced in a dense spike two to six inches long, on top of a stem which can be five to six inches tall, and rarely more, about 28 inches. Plantain is wind-pollinated and propagates primarily by seeds which are held on the long narrow spikes, which rise well above the foliage. Each plant can produce up to 20,000 seeds, which are very small and oval shaped. Quick side note, it is now early spring, and this is what plantain looks like when it's first coming up. This is a common weed that grows in lawns and fields along roadsides and in other areas that have been disturbed by humans. It does particularly well in compacted or disturbed soils. It is believed to be one of the first plants to reach North America after European colonization. Reportedly brought to the Americas by Puritan colonizers, plantain was known among some native peoples as the common name white man's footprint because it thrived in the disturbed and damaged ecosystems surrounding European settlements. The ability of plantain to survive frequent trampling and colonize compacted soils makes it important for soil rehabilitation. Its roots break up hard pan surfaces while simultaneously holding together the soil to prevent erosion. The seeds of plantain are a common contaminant in cereal grain and other crop seeds. The leaves are edible as a salad grain when young and tender, but they quickly become tough and fibrous as they get older. The older leaves can be cooked in stews. The leaves contain calcium and other minerals, as well as beta-carotene. The seeds are so small that they are tedious to gather, but they can be ground into a flower, substitute, or extender. Plantain also has many herbal uses in medicine. Now, buckhorn plantain has a slightly different look, but very similar uses. So to identify buckhorn, this plant is a rosette-forming perennial herb with leafless, silky, hairy flower stems. The basal leaves are lancelet, spreading or erect, scarcely toothed, with three to five strong parallel veins narrowed to a short petiole. The flower stalk is deeply furrowed, ending in an ovoid inflorescence of many small flowers with a pointed bract. Each inflorescence can produce up to 200 seeds. Flowers are about four millimeters. So this plant is considered a weed for the most part because it spreads so profusely and it doesn't really stay where it belongs. If you wanted to weed it out, it's super easy to do it. It's a very shallow, fibrous root system. Just use your shovel or a hori hori or something and dig it up. No big deal at all. The thing is, I've left it here on purpose mainly because I wanted to use it for herbal medicine for my baby, but I even have let it flower and go to seed because I want more of it. And I've been mowing around the ones in my lawn because I want more in my lawn. <laughs> It's just a super convenient thing that stays green, and I'm not going to have to worry about mowing it very much. So next year, I should have tons of these growing in my lawn. I will go ahead and mow, and then it'll just be green leaves. Plus, with me mowing around them in the lawn, they made really cool additions to my Halloween display. So if you want more information on this or any other herbs with medicinal and other uses, here are a couple of Jessica's favorite books. So I brought along Wild Remedies by Rosalie de la Fore, who you can find in the Metal Valley in Central Washington. And this is an excellent source of pictures and recipes and just great understanding for the basics of herbalism. And then um, 
the esteemed Michael Moore, of course, has written this book, which does not have wonderful pictures, but it has fantastic drawings and a breadth of, and depth of information all about the habitat, how to collect, when to collect, which part, etc. Et and then on the food side, um, Thomas Alpal has created a host of amazing resources, but this particular book on food and foraging is really great. So thanks for watching everybody. I hope this was valuable and educational and really worthwhile. If you liked the video, please remember to tell me by hitting the like button. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have any questions, please leave them in a comment below. And on that note, see, see you, you in, in the, the garden. garden.